perspectives on heart failure preserved ejection fraction. It's not just a fashionable diagnosis. It is reality. And let's just do a case. I don't have to define heart failure. Here's a 74-year-old woman. NYHA class 2, 3 for shortness of breath. Long-standing hypertension, diabetes. Some CKD. A BMI of 32. Uh, unable to, you can't see neck veins because most clinicians don't look at the JVP in any case. Some basal crackles. Some pedal edema. You do some blood work. NT Pro BNP of 550. EGFR 48. You do an echo. You've been taught to do echo by Professor J.C. Mohan. Ejection fraction 60%. Some left ventricular hypertrophy. E by E prime of 10. And left atrial volume index of 33 mils per meter square. So is this HFPEF? Is this HFPEF? You look at it. What is, the, what is unique? Fatigue, breathlessness. NYHA class 2, 3. Obese. Signs of heart failure. Biomarker evidence of heart failure and structural changes which are consistent with HFPEF. So we also look at the EKG, find atal fibrillation. Another confounder, because atal fibrillation can actually sometimes cause atrial remodeling and be confused with HFPEF, but the worst part is that HFPEF and atal fibrillation can actually be combined. So is this an uncommon thing? Is it only something which happens in the obese or it happens because of a lot of comorbidities? Well, even in our country, from the inter-CHF data, we know that 40 to 50 percent of patients are having HFPEF in the metropolitan cities where most of us practice. This is increasing. So let's review what is in a name. Where did this all start? We clearly know that reduced ejection fraction less than 40 percent behaves in a certain fashion. And we also realized when we were doing the charm preserved trial that those who did have uh, ejection fraction more than 50 percent could also have heart failure, but they behaved in a little different fashion. So what is it? And this time uh, in 2016, a new animal got introduced called the mid-range ejection fraction. And we had this magical figures of less than 40 percent ejection fraction more than 50% ejection fraction and 40 to 49%. But the diagnosis of heart failure was with clinical diagnosis of heart failure, elevated levels of natriuretic peptide, and at least one additional criteria of either left ventricular hypertrophy or left atrial enlargement and features of diastolic dysfunction. So all this, why was mid-range really introduced? And I will just cover mid-range quickly here because we wanted to think whether this behaves as a reduced ejection fraction, which has improved, a, a preserved ejection fraction, which is deteriorated, or, or something which, is, which has got specific treatments. So um, could it be that now the ejection fraction is improving? We, for long, we believed that it was only an obese person who could have this disease. It was only an older person could have a disease. But, and what we realized also was that we did not have satisfactory treatment options for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction other than decongestion. So is it a causation? Is it an association? Is, is, there, is it just a surrogate marker? So it was something which has been bothering us. This middle child, have there been enough and more editorials? Uh, Scott Sol Solomon was quoted just a little while ago. Uh, and, and, and is it just something which is unique? We know that some of these studies say that the characteristics are similar to have PEF and, and, and we really need to understand how we are going to place this, does the etiology matter? And if we look at how the mid-range is treated today, well, if you look at Sweetheart getting to, uh, to targets, chart 2, time CHF, we find that most of them have decongestion. Uh, still a large number have uh, ACE inhibitors or um, ARBs used. A significant amount do have beta blockers used. So is this, uh, and a few do have MRAs used. And is this just HEF-REF manifesting differently? About 1 to 7 percent do get ICDs, and 1 to 11 percent get CRTs. Uh, 1 to 7 percent get anticoagulants. Some get platelet inhibitors, some get statins. So is it because of CAD or comorbidities? So this has been a food for thought. So we are not very clear as to where 40 to 49 figures, but we are clear 
as to what 50 and above figures. So how do we diagnose it? We need to have, we need to have clear uh, diagnostic algorithms. We can diagnose uh, the diastolic dysfunction either invasively by looking at the LVDP or the pulmonary capillary wedge. We can check it out by structural abnormalities or functional abnormalities. And we all know that the heart has luciotropic properties, which means that it's not just the contraction, which is energy dependent, it is also the relaxation of the ventricle, which is energy dependent. And we come on a steeper curve if we are, if we are dealing with a stiffer ventricle. So if you want to look at the diagnosis, there are a variety of sophisticated echo techniques which all use, whether we're using global longitudinal strain, whether we're using mitral inflow velocities, we're using tissue Doppler, we are using left atrial strain, or we are looking at the RV by either looking at, at the cap or the RV tissue Doppler imaging, or even the PS systolic pressure. All this is put together in trying to achieve a diagnosis. We look at signs of LA enlargement, and, and there, there are some arbitrary cutoff uh, values. We look at the LA volumes, which can be the synchronon of, of uh, left ventricular dis uh, diastolic dysfunction. We can Primarily, we look at the E by E prime, which is an estimation of the LV filling pressure. And we know that if the E by E prime is more than 12 in the lateral, or uh, then we are looking at an elevated uh, LVDP. So uh, there, there are other parameters which, which, can also be, which can also be put together. We know that E prime and E by E prime ha do have certain limitations. They cannot be used with mitral analog calcification, mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, with prosthetic mitral rings, and so on and so forth, but they can be used in atrial fibrillation. There are new methods, which I don't want to confuse you, but except to say that there's pulmonary venous flow, tissue Doppler, color M mode, LA volume, and we are stepping out of the left ventricle shadow and looking at left atrium per, per se, and trying to see whether left atrium failure with, and we are estimating now left atrial strain, and we realize that the left atrial dysfunction corresponds to HEFBEF prognosis. We also think that we should look very carefully at the right ventricle. It's an ignored ventricle. But largely, if your patient has a right ventricle which starts becoming dysfunctional, and yesterday there were some, some people alluded to worsening renal function. To my mind, worsening renal function, you need to look at the right ventricle very carefully because there are no great drugs to handle the right ventricle dysfunction, except maybe handle the left ventricle better. So how do you diagnose right ventricle dysfunction? Like I said, you can look at a variety of parameters. The American Society used different parameters, and we put them down together as phenotypical assessment and used additional markers. In some cases, which may have, appear to have normal uh, echoes, and you still suspect HEF-PEF, you can do a diastolic stress echo, and this can be done with any exercise. It's like doing an invasive LVDP. What about biomarkers? Well, very clearly, uh, Raghavendra just referred to the myocardial stretch, which is BNP or NT-pro BNP. And, but there are many confounders of nit nitritic peptide uh, interpretation. For example, in increasing age, renal insufficiency, we would expect higher nitritic peptides than, than normal. And in obese people or with flash pulmonary edema or burnt out cardiomyopathy, we may not get the nitritic peptides that we expect. And this can change with a variety of, there are different algorithms and we can go through. So we should not miss this diagnosis because many of these people go undiagnosed. Uh, Professor Mohan mentioned that they may, could be in renal clinics. They are uh, largely with physicians. They are largely with endocrinologists. And there are many misconceptions about it. Firstly, is it that all diastolic dysfunction is HEFPEF? Not really, because, because pure diastolic heart failure is actually very rare. The second myth is that it is benign. No, it is not, because, because the mortality in HEFPEF is, is, is really quite high and the survival is quite poor. The next myth is that we understand the etiology. There are some potential mechanisms, dysfunctional calcium, abnormalities in titan protein, uh, myocardial CGMP, but it is not, not no one uh, etiopathogenic factor. Is it just a collection of comorbidities and not a disease? Not really, because this disease does have specific clinical manifestation. Do we know by what we mean by preserved? Uh, well, we have a study data from the charm preserved, and we know that there is no real therapy other than decongestion when the LVEF is more than 40%. 
The next myth is that diagnosing it is difficult. Actually, if you know what you're looking for, it is not. You have to keep it simple. Look at the clinical symptoms and signs, normal ejection fraction, and look for, uh, there are various things which have been pointed out. Uh, there was a discussion yesterday about diagnosing conditions like amyloidosis and Fabry's disease. So you look at hef, whether it is really HEFBEF, are the filling pressures optimized, are there reversible causes, are there uh, significant comorbidities. Suffice to know that systolic function is far from normal in most patients of FBEF. You can have strain abnormalities and an impaired systolic function in FBEF may have a role of spironolactone here. So preserved EF does not mean actually preserved systolic function. There are some scores which are now introduced. We have the ESC HEFPEF score, which, is, which uses a pre-step assessment and echo, natriuretic peptide, further workup, and etiological workup. And, and this has been put together as what is defined as the Berlin score with major and minor criteria, much like the Jones criteria, which can be used. Uh, REDI has just published, I think, last month in circulation the H2 HEFPEF diagnostic score. And, and this is heavy hypertensive atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension, elderly, and filling pressure and they have they showed that there it was well calibrated it was well validated and there was a strong discrimination and uh, they, the patients were actually picked up from the Mayo Clinic practice and and these 45% uh, of them had early HEFPEF who only had exercise related uh, disease is HEFPEF one disease well, Sanjeev Shah has worked extensively in this, and we actually tried to get Sanjeev Shah for this meeting, but, but he did phenomapping using demographic data, physical examination, lab data, ECG, echo, and invasive measurement, and he defined three pheno groups, one being a BNP deficiency syndrome, second being obesity cardiometabolic HFPEF phenotype, and the third being a RV failure cardiorenal phenotype. And if you look at it, 30% of HFPEF may not even have what is used for the diagnosis. They may have low BNP, and there are certain reasons why this can happen. Diastolic dysfunction is uh, usually important for diagnosis, but not mandatory, because you may sometimes have to resort to a cath. A normal BNP very clearly does not rule out. So here's another patient. We, we, we see this patient is wet. We, we, uh, we, what do we do? Uh, should, we, should we dry him out? Should we do a cath? So HEPF is actually a heterogeneous syndrome. So there are many faces, and uh, in, in, in the interest of time, I'm just going to conclude here, except to say that there, was, there were a lot of attempts made with a lot of drugs. We, decongestion is mandatory in treating um, HEPF symptoms, because that is the only thing that works. Spinolactone, Professor Mohan mentioned yesterday, the top cat data let us to review because there were geographical differences in how uh, the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist worked. And if it, that trial had turned positive, we would have been using a lot more uh, spinolactone and aprilinone. Well, the other drugs all actually failed, whether it was Ivabradine, whether it was, whether it was Versiguat, they all actually, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, they all failed. There is some potential role for, there is some potential role for using beetroot juice because it contains nitrites rather than nitrates. Nitrates have no role. Then in the future, we think that two groups of drugs, which are like the holy grail of heart failure today, the ARNIs and the SGLT2 inhibitors, and you know that the Paraquan and the Paramount studies have been done in, in, in HEFPEF, and, and uh, they are, uh, they, they're still work in progress, and empagliflozine work and canagliflozine work in HEFPEF may actually turn out to be positive. If you have a very high LA pressure, and the patient is exceedingly symptomatic, you can actually create an atrial shunt by using a device like the Corvia device, which can decompress the LA and your symptoms can be relieved. Thank you very much. Thank you.